Here at Duende we specialize on OAuth and OpenID Connect. In this series you learn how these actually work. And the intention is to explain the parts about these two standards that are recommended and usable today to give you the foundation to work with them. The code demos in this series will use .NET, but all concepts are applicable to any platform. I'm Roland Guit for Duende Software, the makers of Identity Server, and we help you create secure applications in your organization. So what to expect in this series? You'll hear about OAuth terminology and architecture, as well as the current OAuth 2.1 version in this video. We'll also cover the recommended protocol flows with their application scenarios. In the next part we'll dive into one of those scenarios, machine to machine communication. You will also see a video where we will learn the concepts around securing APIs. And there's one about interactive applications, applications involving a user, where we will look at OpenID Connect. The final video has some slightly more advanced topics that cover adding more authentication features and more application scenarios. To explore the concepts I'm talking about as an example, let's take an API that exposes calendar data. It might be an API from Google, for example. Let's imagine we, as a third party to Google, want to create an application that uses data from the API. If this API was requiring a username and password, the only way to access the data would be to let users enter their Google credentials in our application so it can access the API on behalf of the user. Of course, that's not desirable from a security standpoint. And that's where OAuth comes in. It can grant an application access on behalf of a user without exposing the user's password. It pulls it off by using tokens. Instead of sending an API the password, a token is sent to the API. The token represents who users are what data they access, and last but not least, for how long. The concept of a token is not new. In the early days, SAML assertions were already used, which were XML based and already contained the base principles of tokens we use today. There's a signature that can be validated. If the validation succeeds, we know for sure the token came from the trusted issuer. It has a time window. In contrast to a password, tokens can be short-lived. There are scopes defined, making it possible to limit access to a specific resource, like just a calendar API, or just read permissions to documents. Also, authentication information around users is carried by the token. Not only who the user is, but also how they authenticate it, for example. And finally, claims. Key value pairs expressing identity information about the caller and the user. An important example of this is a claim called subject, which identifies a user by a unique ID. So now that we know the concept of a token, what is OAuth and how does it work? We're going through the terminology as it is described in the OAuth specification. These terms are not commonly used in day-to-day -day communication, but I'll fill you in on the alternative names too. OAuth is all about protecting resources. A resource could be the calendar API I mentioned earlier, or an email inbox, or customer management. These resources run on a server called the resource server. OAuth isn't specific about how that resource server should look like, but nowadays we almost always use APIs. There's also the authorization server. Its task is to determine if someone is allowed to access the resources. It is also responsible for creating tokens that an application that wants to access the resources can use to consume them. The resource server and the authorization server are owned by the same organization, so they trust each other. 
Clients are applications that want to access resources, the APIs. Like a web application running in the browser and applications running on a phone or on a desktop. A backend application can also be a client. For example, if the API of an external organization wants to access ours. The specification divides clients into two groups, public and confidential. Where confidential clients are applications that are controllable within the organization, like a server rendered web application. That is able to keep a secret, because the server is outside of the reach of a user. A SPA or single page application is an example of a public client. That runs in the browser outside of the control of the organization. And it isn't very good at keeping a secret because it can easily be extracted by a tech savvy user or an attacker. Another example of a public client is the mobile application. Some of these clients of course have users, called resource owners in the OAuth specification. They own data on the resource server. Note the distinction between users and clients. Users are humans that have some sort of account within an organization. And they use clients, which are applications that access data on behalf of the user. Now that we know the terminology, how do all these actors interact? In order to access a resource, a client has to get a token from the authorization server. It does that with an authorized request. When validation of that request succeeds, the token is returned and from this point onwards, the client can access the protected API by attaching the token to each request. The tokens we're talking about here of course have the same benefits the SAML assertions I showed you have. They are short-lived, convey information about the user and are able to access a limited amount of resources using scopes. Now let's take a closer look at scopes. A scope is a string that is sent along with the authorized request. It expresses the scope of access that the client needs on the resource server. If more scopes need to be requested, they can be separated by using a space. So let's say we have a calendar and an inbox resource. Two scopes can be defined on the authorization server using these logical names. Once they are defined, we can allow each client access to a set of these scopes. Client A could have access to just the calendar scope. And client B could have access to both calendar and inbox. When the client then requests the scopes, the authorization server will verify that the scopes requested match with the scopes assigned to the client. Scopes can also be finer grained. We could define multiple scopes for the calendar API, like read calendar and write calendar. These scopes are also readable by the API, so in that way we can limit access within one resource. Let's take GitHub as an example. When no scope is defined, public information can still be read. But when full access to repositories is needed, the repo scope has to be requested. That goes for both private and public repositories. If just access to public repos is needed, there is a scope for that too. Google, with much more resources, have a more structured approach. They use URLs as scope names, which indicate the name of the API and the type of access needed. OAuth doesn't give you any guidance on how to organize scopes. It's up to you and your organization to come up with something that suits. In the coming videos we'll dive deeper into how a token is obtained, but I'll provide you with an overview here. A flow is a way a client can obtain tokens from the authorization server. Originally there were more flows defined in the specification, but OAuth 2.1 simplifies that. There are now just two left, one for interactive clients and one for non-interactive clients. An interactive client is working with users, a non-interactive client isn't. Examples of the latter client are worker processes, 
but also server-to-server -server scenarios like when the API outside of our organization wants to access our APIs. The client credentials flow is for non-interactive clients. Authorization code flow is used for interactive clients. Regardless of which flow is used, there are important rules around access tokens. The first one is that the client isn't allowed to read the contents of it. It should just store it and use it for API requests. The token format and the content are a private implementation detail between authorization server and resource. And then there are the validation rules I already talked about, together with some additions. By the way, you typically don't write the code to validate a token. Almost always some kind of library is used for that. In ASP.NET Core there's the JWT bearer authentication handler, for example. OAuth doesn't specify what the token should actually look like. It leaves that open, but it is very common nowadays for the tokens to be in the JSON web token format. JWT is the acronym, which is often pronounced as JWT. The token encapsulates the authorization that the client application was granted. In this case the token means, here's a client called Client1, and I give it access to API1, and I, the issuer on this URL, made that decision. The token was issued at this timestamp, and it will expire at this Unix timestamp. So you can see all the good things of XAML assertions are here just now in a simpler format. This information is Base64 encoded before it is sent over to the wire. And to prove it really came from the authorization server, the token is also signed. The header information indicates what key and algorithm was used to do that. That part is also Base64 encoded. When the token arrives at the API, it has to be validated. By doing that, it knows that the token came from the authorization server it trusts, while at the same time being sure there was no tampering along the way. To validate the token, the API will need a public key, and that can be found in the metadata of the authorization server, which is exposed using the discovery endpoint. The URL of that endpoint is mentioned in the spec. When accessing it with the browser, a lot of configuration details are shown. The location of the other endpoints, the scope supported, and so on. The JORGS URL is the answer to the public key question. The response of a request to that endpoint shows the public key. And this key is typically cached by the API, so that it doesn't have to be fetched on each and every incoming request. That was it for this video. Now make sure you catch the next one in the series too.